video four of chapter seven, where we will continue our exploration into sampling distributions. Now, do M&Ms or Skittles have more orange candies? To investigate, I take a random sample of 50 candies of each type, and I found 22% of my M&Ms were orange, and I found 28% of my Skittles were orange. So I found a difference of 6% in the sample proportions of my orange Skittles versus M&Ms. If you took separate random samples of 50 candies each, would you also get a 6% difference? And some of you might get a 6% difference, but there's a really good chance that most of you are going to get some other difference. So just because I got a 6% difference, does that really mean that there is a difference in the percentage and the proportion of orange candies that are in M&Ms and in Skittles? I don't know. That's what we will explore in this video. So according to each company's website, M&M's supposedly, and this is true, M&M's supposedly contain 20% orange candies. And they have all the other percentages for all the other colors as well, but we're going to focus just on orange candies. Skittles supposedly contain 21.6% orange candies. So according to the company's websites, we could claim... Uh, that based on their population data, that Skittles do, Skittles should contain a slightly higher percentage of orange candies than M&M's orange candies. Now, if I expected to see a 1.6% difference, because that would be the difference in what the company's claims are, but I actually saw a 6% difference. That kind of seems like a much bigger difference, right? 6% versus 1.6%. I mean, it's a little over three times bigger of a difference. Should we be sus about the company's claims on their website? Or did we just experience what's called sampling variability? Did I just happen to get, uh, you know, a, not necessarily one, but maybe both of my samples contained maybe just a naturally uh, different amount of orange M&Ms and or orange Skittles. Sure, that could happen, right? But based on my one sample, should I be suspicious? And that's, again, what we're going to test. Now, this part here, I don't want you to write down in your notes, if you're taking notes from me, um, because this is kind of what we were initially doing in the previous video. We were looking at the sampling distributions just really of one population. And so on the left side, I have the sampling distribution of orange Skittles. I verify the shape is approximately normal. I have the center being at 21.6%, which is the claim that was made from the uh, company's website. And the 10% condition applies for the standard deviation. I can assume that there's more than 500 Skittles overall. And I'm not looking at all orange Skittles, but all Skittles in general. And so I can freely calculate the standard deviation value to be almost 6%. Now for M&Ms, I can verify that its sampling distribution should be approximately normal based on my sample size of 50. The center is about the 20% that the company's claim is. And I also can assume they're easily over than 500 M&Ms overall. And its standard deviation is about the same uh, actually as the Skittles standard deviation. Now, these were the individual sampling distributions. Now, oftentimes, if I want to compare two values coming from two separate sampling distributions, we did some probability questions similar to this back in chapter six, and we can use some of those same rules to help us out. So if I wanted to look at the sampling distribution of the difference in the proportions, right? Because I found a 6% difference. I should have maybe only seen a 1.6% difference according to the company's website claims. So consider this. If I had a normal distribution for my Skittles and I had a normal distribution for my M&Ms and I subtract a normal distribution from a normal distribution, we again talked about this last chapter, that that would still be an approximately normal distribution. If I were to add together two approximately normal distributions, it would just create a larger approximately normal distribution. So the key is, is that both of the individual 
sampling distributions are approximately normal, and therefore the difference of two normal distributions is still a normal distribution. So I still get to use normal CDF to calculate any claim or any probability of an event occurring. Now, the differences in the centers or in the means. So this is what comes into play from chapter six, where we talked about combining random variables. These are two different random variables. We have Skittles as a random variable, and we have M&Ms as a random variable. So if you remember, if I want to find the mean difference between the two, then I was allowed to just subtract the individual means. So I can just subtract the 21.6% and the 20% from each other to find, again, that number that I mentioned previously. On average, I would expect to see a 1.6% difference between the proportion of orange uh, Skittles and the proportion of orange M&Ms. And then in terms of the spread. Now, again, this comes into play from last chapter. Since I am subtracting my random variables, if I want to find the standard deviation, we never subtracted the individual standard deviations, but we had to square them individually and then add them together. Regardless, if we were adding or subtracting our random variables, we always added together the squared standard deviations. And then to account for the squaring, later we had to square root the entire thing. So again, this is kind of a little review from chapter six. But the combined standard deviation for the sampling distribution of the difference is a little over 8%. So if the sampling distribution of the difference of the proportions of orange Skittles and orange M&Ms is approximately normal with a mean of 0 0.016 with a standard deviation of 0 0.0812, lost it there, what is the probability that we would see a difference of 6% or higher than. So consider, this can be my sampling distribution. We knew that it was approximately normal. We verified that. We knew the mean in the middle was 1.6%. And we are testing the claim of 6% because that's what I saw happen in my samples when I subtracted them. So where would I find 6% at in my sampling distribution? We know it's going to be greater than the mean, but how much greater than the mean? How many standard deviations? Well, if a standard deviation is worth 8% and the mean's already at 1.6% and I need to get to 6%, I'm not even going a full standard deviation above the mean. So again, go about halfway down the curve, back up a little bit, about right here is maybe one standard deviation. So if I wanted to give a good estimate, I don't know, maybe 6% is right here. So we'll say the difference in the proportions in the Skittles and the M&Ms, there's where I would find a 6% difference in the sample proportions. And I'm going to go 6% or higher. Now, again, the main reason why I'm going higher is because I'm already on the right side of the sampling distribution. So to give that 6% difference any meaning, I can't just find the probability of 6% and I'm done because the probability of a segment was 0%. So 6% or higher gives that 6% some weight. It gives it some area tagging along to it. So now this is where I would get to use normal CDF. But first I'm going to write the probability statement that I'm really calculating here. What is the probability that what we would see, we saw again, the difference in our sample proportions, the difference of our Skittle orange M&Ms minus the proportion of our orange M&Ms to be 6% or higher, greater than or equal to 0 0.06, will be equal to, and again, we get to use normal CDF. The lower bound based on my picture is the 6%. The upper bound is infinity, or we could say realistically 100%. And the mean was 1.6%. The standard deviation was 8.12%. So again, good practice is to label lower bound, upper bound, mean, standard deviation. And that comes out to be approximately, well, I don't know, let's go grab the calculator here. So normal CDF. Lower bound, 6%, upper bound, 999. 
mean 0.016, standard deviation 0.0812. Now I know my answer is going to be uh, less than 50%, but really it shouldn't be too crazy less than 50%. Let me get 29 29.4%. 29.4%. 29.4%. So my sample that I saw was a 6% difference. I expected to see a 1.6% difference. How rare is my 6% difference when I expected a 1.6% difference? It happens about close to 30% of the time. So should I be surprised to see a 6% difference? Absolutely not. If it happens about 30% of the time, that's not a abnormal probability to occur. We usually said if the probability is less than 5%, and it actually happened. We should be surprised that that event actually occurred. So now, to kind of recap what we really did here, when we want to look at what is the shape, the center, and the spread of our sampling distribution for the difference in sample proportions, we technically need to verify that both sampling distributions are approximately normal. And therefore, when we subtracted them, we were still going to get an approximately normal distribution. So we have to check the n times p and the n times 1 minus p for both of our populations, for both of our uh, sampling distributions here. So all four of these have to come out to be greater than or equal to 10. And if just one of them ends up not exceeding 10, then in the end, we can't say the shape of the sampling distribution of the difference is approximately normal. And therefore, we wouldn't be able to use normal CDF to calculate our probability. For the center, what we ended up doing was we said, well, if we were subtracting our two random variables here, we really got to subtract the individual means. But the individual means, if you think about it, mu sub p hat of our first sample is really just the population proportion p. So instead of thinking of it as subtracting the means, we're really going to be subtracting the population proportions. That mu sub p hat of our second sample is really just the second population proportion. And so again, that was like the 21.6% and the 20%. We just got to subtract those. So you can think of it this way, but in the end, we can just think of it as the difference is the difference in the two population proportions. And then for the standard deviations, this is where we said we're not going to subtract these together because we always have to add, but we always have to add the squared standard deviations. So again, you can think of it this way, like how we thought of it back in chapter 6, uh, but what do each of these individually represent? Well, the individual standard deviation squared would really be, instead of square root of p times 1 minus p over n, when we square that square root, then we just get p times 1 minus p all over n. And then you're going to go, yeah, but there's still a square root over it. But it's the square root over the entire sum instead of the individual pieces themselves. So this formula, ooh, that is quite the formula in there. So the square root of the entire first standard deviation, and this has technically already been squared because the normal standard deviation was already a square root. So it's kind of like there's a square root, and then we're saying we're going to square that individual square root. And that's why that square root and that square cancel, and it leaves us with just this part. And then the same thing happens for the second standard deviation. Technically, this is already going to be a square root, and then it's going to cancel that out, and then we end up with just that fractional part there. Now, the other thing for the standard deviations is that the 10% condition, the independent condition, has to be checked for both populations. So again, like I showed earlier, I'd have to check, are all Skittles greater than or equal to 500? Are all M&Ms greater than or equal to 500? I still have to verify that both of those check out in order for me to use this formula. So I have a problem for you to try out. The name brand goldfish, which I can't really say their name brand, uh, contain 35% red fish. 
And these aren't just the ones that are all orange, because obviously then they'd be 100% orange. But the name brand goldfish of a certain type of variety of goldfish contain 35% redfish. Generic goldfish crackers from your local supermarket contain 30% redfish. Each bag of goldfish crackers contains over 300 goldfish. What I want you to do, and we'll discuss the next day in class, is to describe the sampling distribution of the difference in the proportion of red goldfish between the name brand and the generic bags based on random samples of size 25. All right, so the 300 again is the population size, and you're only taking random samples of size 25. So try that out. Give me the shape, the center, and the spread, and we will verify that and do a follow-up question related to this the next day in class.